They're coming to get you, Barbara. Hello everyone, it's the Metal Geek. How y'all doing? And now this this doesn't actually quite feel right. Why why don't we try this? There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. <laughs> Hello everybody, how y'all doing? In case you haven't figured it out already, today we're going to be looking at the 1968 classic Night of the Living Dead from George A. Romero. Now again guys, for those of you who know me, I love horror. Horror TV, horror movies, you name it, I love the horror genre in general. And what would horror movies be like in all honesty today without this film? Barbara? Stop it! You're acting like a child! They're coming for you! Look, there comes one of them now. Now there's a lot that could be said about the horror genre going all the way back to the classics like The Mummy, Dracula, Wolfman. But let's be honest here. If there is one film out there, one horror film that really changed the landscape of how horror films were going to be made for the next few decades, right up until today, Night of the Living Dead is that standard. Not only does it put a much larger emphasis on the actual horror of the story, it's not just about the blood, guts, and gore, though that is in the film. It's actually about the tension, the quietness, those moments where you know things are building up and it's going to explode into something larger. And that all happens because of a very thoughtful script and very, very excellent direction. Now it's no secret, George Romero has talked about it himself, this movie does have a deeper meaning. This is an allegory for the Cold War. What happens if biological warfare were to happen, or some sort of radiation were to cause the dead to come back and attack the living? It's brilliant warfare! So we're talking about a major fear. Now the Cold War was not anything to laugh at because during that time the idea of biological warfare or nuclear warfare was extremely high and I mean extremely high and people were legitimately afraid that at any moment that that could happen and that BAM society is gone. So you leave it up to a filmmaker like George Romero who wanted to say a little bit about that. You put it into the horror genre, you get some brilliant actors, you take brilliant direction, and you have a great script. And what you come up with is perhaps the most revolutionary horror film, not only of its time, but ever made. Now sure, you could say, Metal Geek, there are a lot of great horror films out there. But how many horror films, I ask you, change the landscape of the horror genre. Give a person who wants to make a movie a camera and if they have direction and if they have enough sense to make the film they will give you something and nine times out of ten it's either going to be brilliant or it's going to be so bad that it's good. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh hi Mark. And we will never look at that again. Ever, 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 ever. Oh, hi, Mark. Okay, I promise, I promise that was the last time. I did not hit her. It's not true. That was the last... It's bullshit. I did not hit her. Oh, hi, Mark. So getting back to this movie. Now, 
Now, I'm not going to go blow for blow with the story. Most people already know this one. Before there was The Walking Dead, before there was The Evil Dead, before there was Zombieland, before there was anything with zombies in it, or at least the modern day zombie, there was this film. And everyone pretty much knows how it goes, but if you don't, the gist of it is, the dead are coming back to life and they're eating the living. Now the story does play out simply enough. It starts out with a sister and a brother going out to pay their respects to an aunt who has passed away. They do it on a yearly basis, but the brother doesn't really care to do it while the sister thinks it's necessary. You think I want to blow Sunday on a scene like this? You know, I figure we're either going to have to move mother out here or move the grave into Pittsburgh. Johnny, it takes you five minutes. Yeah, five minutes to put the wreath on the grave and six hours to drive back and forth. Now, the brother's name is Johnny. You can remember or you don't have to. He's not in a lot of the film. And the sister's name is Barbara. While not the main character, is one of the main characters in this film. Now, for those of you who have seen the remake, you're going to remember Barbara as kind of being this extremely kick-ass character, almost Sarah Connor-like. Well, if you haven't seen the 1968 version, get that out of your head because that's not the Barbara you're going to see in this film. Now, Barbara is kind of a weak and meek character in this movie. At times, she'll even annoy some people. The real standout here is that she meets up with Ben, just like in the remake with Tom Savini directing. But in this movie, Ben is really the focal character, where in Remake, again, it's Barbara, and he's kind of the co-star. In this, it's Ben, and she's kind of the co-star. Kind of. She's there, but she spends a lot of time not talking, and crying, and being scared of the zombies, and... Well, again, this is not the Barbara from the Tom Savini remake. I think you should just calm down. So basically, her and her brother, they're out in the graveyard, they get attacked by a zombie, and Johnny is accidentally killed. Or at least in the 1968 version, you don't really know if he's killed or just knocked out. But she's left alone, she tries to escape in the car, but she ends up kind of getting in a car accident and runs out to a house out in the woods. And this is where she meets Ben, who tries to help her out and tries to fortify the house. Now, Ben is very resourceful. This is where I'm going to get into a little bit of trivia about the actual story and how it was written. Now, originally in the script, Ben was supposed to be not necessarily white or black or any particular race or color. He was just written to kind of be like this loudmouth trucker. But during the casting, they ended up meeting up with Dwayne Jones, who would go on to play Ben. And Dwayne was a very educated man, both in the arts and in academics, and when he got into the park, he made a lot of changes to make Ben more sophisticated, and they really lost that loudmouth trucker kind of feel, but it gave you a very sophisticated, very resourceful character that you could believe could hold up this house until help happened to come by. We can find some wood, some boards, something about the fire pit, something we can nail this place up. But before we get too much into the actors and their performances, basically what ends up happening is Ben is going to fortify the house. And while he's doing that, unknown to him and Barbara down in the basement, there's a whole set of other characters that have been hiding out from the zombie attack. Hold it! Don't shoot! We're from town! A radio! So Ben's doing all this work upstairs and all these people downstairs are just kind of hanging out. Now they know there's something going on upstairs, but they don't want to check it out because as far as they're concerned, it could be the zombies or it could be somebody being attacked by the zombies or it could be somebody dangerous and they just don't want to take the chance. I mean, you didn't hear the racket was making up here. How are we supposed to know what was going on? Could have been those things for all we knew. That girl was screaming. Sure, you must know what a girl screaming sounds like. Those things don't make any noise. Anybody would know somebody that needed help. Well, that's actually more, you know, of the character 
Cooper. Now, let me be honest with you. This guy is loudmouth, and all you want to do the entire time is punch him every time he opens his mouth. All right. Now, you tell me. I'm not going to take that kind of a chance when we got a safe place. We luck into a safe place, and you're telling us we got to risk our lives just because somebody might need help, huh? Now, Cooper's first name is Harry, just so we get that out there. And, like I said, he's a very loudmouth character, and you really don't like him. I don't think you're supposed to like him. He's supposed to be a very unlikable character. But he isn't without his points. He's not wrong about everything. And I'm telling you, those things turned over our car. We were damn lucky to get away at all. Now, you tell me those those things can't get through this lousy pile of wood? His wife and kids downstairs. Kids hurt. Again, Cooper, very loudmouth. Ben, very, very educated and resourceful. They clash in a very big way because Cooper's like, we got to stay downstairs because downstairs we only have to worry about protecting one door, the door that goes downstairs, where if we stay up here, we have to protect all the windows and doors. And it doesn't matter if they're boarded up or not because these things were strong enough to flip over our car and they're going to get through those doors and those windows even if they are boarded up. Ben's argument is that if you go downstairs and they do get in, there's nowhere for you to run. You're dead. You're going to be dead meat if you stay down there because if they get in, you can't go anywhere. So they have both legitimate arguments. One is not wrong because you are protecting a much larger space and a lot more ways in, but if you trap yourself into one area, you're not getting out. So they're not wrong. Neither one of them are wrong. It's just that they're not working together, and that is the moral of the story. you got to work together to get through this, and if they had, well, we'll get to that. So back to the story. Basically, the idea at this point is that there's going to be a major clash between Ben and Cooper. It's going to be an alpha male thing. Who's going to get the upper hand? Who's going to get the, well, who's not, basically. Ben is going to go on and continue fortifying the house. Come up with various ideas. Cooper is going to continue to say that they should be going downstairs. And this is where Tommy's going to come in. Kind of the middleman. The person that's trying to gel everything together. Wait a minute. Let's think about this. We can make it to the cellar if we have to. And if we do decide to stay down there, we'll need some things from up here. So let's at least consider this a while. You see, Tommy's kind of got this southern kind of young boy thing going on. Some people might even consider it kind of a redneckish type of attitude, but it's not so much. He is familiar with the country, he is familiar with the area. It's not his house, but he was familiar with the house because he knows the area. But he's also the little Jimmy the Cricket that sits on the shoulder of both of these alpha males arguing to try to get them to work together. Say, that's pretty swell. His argument is that, guys, neither one of you are wrong, but hey, Cooper, if we stay upstairs, we always have the option of going downstairs if we lose the upstairs, and then we can protect the one door you're talking about. But of course, Cooper will have none of that, and of course, you just want to... But back to Tommy, because Tommy is, again, the moral compass of this story. He is going to get Cooper and Ben to work well enough together for a little while. So they do start getting some plans together. They do start getting the house a little bit more fortified. But when it becomes apparent that Cooper is just not going to cooperate and he's going to go back downstairs, Tommy then calls his girlfriend up, who is also downstairs. Her name is Judy. Judy, come on up here. Now, Judy is a resourceful character as well. She is actually a fairly strong female character. Not overly defined in the movie, but she does have a strong attitude. She certainly is not like Barbara. So Judy comes up and Cooper goes back down. And, well, downstairs also is Cooper's wife. Her name is Helen. They also have a daughter, and their daughter is down there injured. She had been bitten by one of the zombies. So she's getting sick, and she's unable to walk. There are two other people upstairs, a man and a girl. We heard you screaming. Yeah, but I didn't know who they were, and I wasn't about to 
take any unnecessary chances. So at this point, you kind of get where Cooper's at, okay? He's trying to protect his family. He's still a complete asshole, but he is trying to protect his family. Now, Helen is a very strong point in this movie. She doesn't have a gigantic part in the movie, and in all respects, she doesn't really do much to push the plot forward, so to speak. But she's a very strong female character who actually stands up to her husband. She is by far and away the strongest female character in the movie. There's a radio upstairs and you boarded us in down here? I know what I'm doing. What did it say? Nothing. Nothing. They don't know anything yet. There's mass murder everywhere and, and people are supposed to look for a safe place to hide. Take the boards off that door. We are staying down here, Helen. Harry, that radio is at least some kind of communication. When she finds out that they had a working radio upstairs and that Cooper willingly decided to go back downstairs, she actually chews him out. She's like, are you crazy? We could be listening to what's going on, getting live reports, finding out if there's help coming our way. Now the rest of the movie kind of plays out like cat and mouse, where Ben is upstairs trying to get the place fortified and Cooper is downstairs trying to keep everybody down there, but eventually he does go back up. They find a live working television and they're getting reports so that they know what's going on. And then they try to concoct a plan where they're going to actually try to get gas into the truck that's outside and actually leave. And there is a gas pump out in the back, it's just locked. They do find the keys for that. So they concoct a plan where they're going to get the truck over to the gas pump, fill the truck with gas, and then they're going to try to get away. Because while staying in the house might be somewhat safe, the zombies are multiplying outside and they need to get out of the area and try to find help. Now Cooper is in on this. He does distract the zombies so that Ben and Tommy can get to the truck outside. Judy does actually follow them reluctantly at first and she gets a little scared but then she jumps into the truck to help and then they get the truck over to the gas pump. The thing with it is the keys that they got aren't the right keys or at least it's not open in the lock so maybe the lock is rusted. So Ben has to shoot the lock off with the shotgun which of course is a bit dangerous but he does do it successfully. Now poor Tommy on the other hand when he takes the gas hose ends up hosing down half the grass area and half of the truck and lying right next to the gas where it's all pouring down is a torch that's lit starts a fire everywhere. Tommy has to jump in the truck, drive the truck away to get it away from the gas tank. What ends up happening, of course, is, well, this is where things don't look so good for poor Judy and Tommy. Crispy goodness. So we are back to square one. Without Tommy or Judy, especially Tommy, there is no middle ground anymore. There isn't that little Jiminy Cricket sitting on anybody's shoulder, so it becomes an outright alpha male feud between Cooper and Ben complete. At this point, Basically, Cooper's trying to get the shotgun from Ben so that he could take over the whole situation. And at some point, he actually does get the shotgun. And that causes Ben to attack Cooper. And that causes Cooper to get shot. You can't say he didn't deserve it. Again, he is a gigantic gigantic asshole but he's not completely dead so he manages to crawl his way back downstairs his wife is upstairs in fact she's basically being dragged out the window by zombies as this is all going on She prompts Barbara to do something! Yes, she finally grows 
something. I don't know if you want to call it a pear or whatever you want to call it, but she grows something and she decides to do something. She acts out and tries to save Helen. So Barbara grabs a board and attacks the zombies and Helen gets away and she runs downstairs and by the time she gets downstairs, her husband had already died and he is on the floor next to the table where their daughter was lying down. And I say was because the daughter basically had died as well and is now a zombie and I think is eating her father's spleen or something. And then of course freaks Helen out, so she kind of tries to get away, but it doesn't work and she falls down and her daughter is just, she grabs this cement hoe and starts stabbing her mother with it and blood is flying everywhere and it's, it's gruesome! Meanwhile, we still have Barbara upstairs who is now getting attacked by the zombies in the window because she attacked the zombies in the window and they're grabbing at her and yeah, they are trying to eat her so she's not having a great time and an even worse time when she finds out that one of the zombies is her brother! Yeah, he did die. He died and then he found his sister and he's like, mmm, flesh, eat, zombie, brains, yum yum and yeah, Ben has to come in to save the day, doesn't save the day, and Barbara is dead. Yes, dead. One true act of courage, and she dies! Now this leaves Ben alone, and Ben is like, ah, uh, great. Perfect. I'm in the basement now, which means I'm giving Cooper this whole idea that maybe the basement was the right decision. And maybe it wasn't, but he's devastated, and he still has his shotgun, and Cooper is on the floor, dead, and gets up because now he's a zombie, so Ben blows his brains out, and yeah, he holds up until morning. And then the rednecks show up, blow the zombies away, and oh yeah, they shoot and kill Ben. Awesome! Ben survives the zombie apocalypse just to get shot in the head by a redneck! Night of the Living Dead truly is one of those rare exceptions where a low-budget movie turns out really, really well because the visionaries behind the film think really, really big. It launched the career of George Romero, who would go on to make an entire series of dead movies throughout the years. Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, so on and so forth. Night of the Living Dead would even go on to be remade in 1990 by Tom Savini, which within itself was actually well received and was actually written by George Romero. What makes Night of the Living Dead so significant is that it changed the way that horror films were made. It showed that horror films could be more than just blood and gore, or it could be more than just hokey and scary. It showed that horror films could actually have a real social commentary. Speaking out against the Cold War, and also being very progressive by casting a black man in the lead role in 1968 when racial tensions were very high. Of course, stories say that Dwayne Jones was cast simply because he was the best actor that auditioned for the role. And George Romero thought it would be very progressive not really addressing that on screen. Though Dwayne Jones himself actually felt that there should have been some sort of social commentary in the movie about that. Nonetheless, Night of the Living Dead 1968 is a very important film, not just for horror, but in cinema in general. It's one of my favorites of all time, and I do love the 1990 remake as well. Which within itself is a great story just hearing about how the movie was made. I mean, some of the trivia out there, a lot of people know that this movie is actually part of the public domain due to a copyright issue. Long story short, the movie was actually copywritten under the name Night of the Flesh Eaters. When the movie's name was changed to Night of the Living Dead and a new title card was made, the company failed to put the copyright notice on the title card. Therefore, the movie is officially not copywritten under the name Night of the Living Dead. And the movie is actually public domain. It's free for anyone to use, watch, and do as they please with, which is a lot of fan-made versions of the movie where they add scenes to the original 1968 version. 
And it's also very readily available because of that, because anybody who wants to produce it on DVD doesn't need anyone's permission to actually produce it on DVD, so there's a lot of different versions released out there. I mean, it's pretty much the same movie, it's just that a lot of different companies have released it, so pick and choose. Whatever one you want, buy it. This is the one I personally owned, which is a colorized version of the movie, though the original black and white version is available on the disc as well. It is a novelty to watch it in color once in a while, but to be honest with you, black and white version is the one that holds up the best. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is my review of Night of the Living Dead. My score is 10 out of 10. It's done so much for cinema. There's no other way to look at it. 10 out of 10, this is the Metal Geek saying, have a great one, guys.